Greetings all, welcome to another Upper Room Gathering online forum. I'm David Martin, the president of the Upper Room Gathering. It's always a pleasure to have you uh, here listening to us and uh, participating with us and listening to the recording on YouTube. Welcome back to Mark Barlin. Uh, it's always exciting for me to have a discussion with Mark and his latest book is excellent. The Dumbest Generation Grows Up from Stupefied Youth to dangerous adults and I sent out a link to, on the invitation and we'll make a link through uh, available so you can see it. it's through Amazon other fine booksellers at, uh, around the, the internet and at your local bookstore. Um, your presence here today is a great blessing and let's start off with prayer. Heavenly Father we come to you and humbly ask for wisdom and patience help us to learn to be listeners send your spirit to guide us let us be aware of how we might treat others with respect and have an attitude of patience. We ask for your blessing on this gathering for those who are online with us now and those listening later. Amen. Amen. Uh, Mark Barillon, a um, little quick introduction, is uh, a professor emeritus of English at Emory University and editor of First Things Magazine. Uh, he hosts a podcast twice a week. And I have to say, Mark, your podcasts are really good. So thank you for that. He's an author of five books, including The Dumbest Generation, How the Di Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardizes Our Future. His commentaries and reviews have appeared, appeared in uh, publications, including The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, and New York Times. And so it's with great pleasure that we uh, offer a warm welcome to uh, Mark Bauerland. Mark oh on you. I, I love the Upper Room Gathering. And I really appreciate it. Mark's also a member of our board of directors, so we should point that out too. So Mark, I think before we really, I'd like to dive into the book, but I thought maybe it would be useful for you to have a minute to give us an overview of the book and maybe tell us a little bit about what prompted you to revisit this demographic and some of the work that you've done before. Right. Well, as you mentioned, the first book was from 2008, The Dumbest Generation. And the subtitle of that was how the digital age stupefies young Americans and jeopardizes our future, or don't trust anyone under 30. Uh, a little joke there in the title. Although, you know, after it came out, I had a, a young reporter at USA Today interview me. She must have been all of 24. And she said, do you really think you can't trust anyone under 30? And I said, <laughs> it's a joke. There was this slogan back in the 60s uh, uh, and, and, and so on. But uh, that book, really came out in response to all the cheerleading that was going on in the first decade of the third millennium of our Lord. And what, uh, what people were saying there was these 15 year olds, they're amazing. They can handle these new tools in ways that run circles around what the old people are doing. What they can do with a handheld, as it was called back then, they do things with this social media thing, this, this Facebook stuff, MySpace. Twitter was just coming out. Instagram would come along. The iPhones in their successive versions would come out. And the young were texting and sharing and, and, and filming and posting uh, and chatting, gaming, all these inventive, innovative things, or so we were told. We also were heard that they are going to college in record numbers. They have all these wonderful, tolerant, progressive attitudes. They really put into office our first African-American president, and they're going to lead America into the 21st century. Hurrah. And I came out with this book, and a few others argued the same thing, saying that, no, no, this is very bad. It is damaging for a 15-year-old to sleep with that phone one foot away from the pillow and be awakened at night if a picture comes through. It isn't good for them to live in such a visual, stimulated environment that the screen would pour into their heads through the new games and the websites and, and the videos. It isn't good for them to follow YouTube's uh, slogan, broadcast yourself. That was what it said in the top left of the screen on YouTube. No, no, we want, we want teenagers to get out of themselves. We want them to read old things. We want them to follow St. Paul's advice. Oh, my brethren, whatever is lovely, whatever is good, what I can't, I can't remember the exact words. 
uh, whatever, whatever is just, whatever is true, think on these things. And that's not what the screen was purveying to them. It was purveying youth culture, peer pressure. That's what those tools meant to the young. Of course, they are great things online. Great things are done online. Good conversations like, like what, what the, your, your, your forums. Uh, and back then, you know, YouTube would have, would have wonderful old videos. Sometimes I'd use them in class, but that's not where the 15 year old went in leisure time. 15 year old went to other 15 year olds. That's what mattered. It was the social side of things. And it was enveloping them in this bubble of adolescence. And grown up stuff couldn't, couldn't penetrate the way it could when we were young. You know, I, I couldn't go to my room and turn on a screen. There was only one screen in the house. There were only five channels. You, you tell the millennial that and go, oh, you poor thing. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't want to listen to some guy with a round face and a mustache talk about named Walter talk about uh, Watergate. So, but I couldn't go anywhere else, right? <laughs> Uh, it was CBS News. That was it. And I couldn't go get on a phone because there was only one phone in the house. It was in the kitchen. You had this dial on it. You had to turn. So it wasn't, wasn't a private thing. It wasn't my, my world that I could create. So adolescence was not something that I could preserve. I saw this would be enabling millennials to maintain their adolescence and adolescence is a bad word it's not a good to call something adolescent is is not a compliment but they they could maintain their adolescence in this bubble world that they were living in and so i wrote that book warning that this is stupefying them and so now, 15 years later, I thought, you know, I'm going to come back to this and see how are the millennials doing now? Well, they, they have rates of depression and anxiety are higher. Narcissism is high. You know, who would have thought that when we give them a tool that they could, you know, take 250 photos of themselves and walk around with that in their pocket, that they become narcissists. Big surprise. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're not happy. There's a sour mood among 30 year olds in America today. They don't have any real religion. And a lot of them have some spiritual, vague, you know, therapeutic ideas about God, but they don't go to church. They don't pray in any consistent, ritualized, organized way, which is important to do. Not just this free floating faith, it's got to be institutionalized and organized because of our fallen natures. Uh, so they don't have God. They don't have country. Only one third of them call themselves patriots. We gave them a country in the, in the education system of which they should feel ashamed because of all the sins and the crimes of American guilt. Uh, so they don't have patriotism. And that's unfortunate because patriotism is actually a good feeling. It gives gratitude. Gratitude's an affirming thing. They have a negation when they, when they look, or when they were told that they should have when they look at their country. The president of the United States says, we've got systemic racism everywhere in America. It's all over the place. You know, so, so we didn't give them a country that makes them feel good. Families, you know, family breakup, family structure is not something that they rely upon very much. They, most of them don't feel multi-generational contact, lineage in any strong way. And then we didn't give them great traditions. We didn't make them read great books. We didn't have them read the great stories of love and honor and betrayal and heroism and villainy. We didn't have them read great speeches from the Sermon on the Mount up through you know, the, the great speeches in 20th century America, you know, Martin Luther King's final words the night before he died. Uh, we didn't give them great music. You know, we filled their heads with all this pop music, horrible stuff, pounding into their heads, bad movies, these silly superhero things. And that's why I begin this new book with the line, what have we done to them? 
what have we done to them? What kind of world have we handed the millennials? We told them that happiness is building your Facebook friend network. Success is having a lot of Twitter followers. Success is doing a little video on YouTube and, and you get 60,000 views. Now, this is, this is a false expectation that we built in them. And we didn't give them the Bible. We didn't give them the Iliad and the Odyssey. We didn't give them Shakespeare's plays. We didn't give them Beethoven's Fifth and, and Michelangelo's uh, 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 Pieta. So they, they've hit the adult world and they don't have the equipment to manage the customary disappointments. I mean, you're all gonna fall in love and you're gonna get rejected, okay? It's an awful feeling. Well, you know, if you have some of the great love stories in your head, so many of which turn out badly, it's not say it's gonna make you feel better, but it's gonna give you a little more comprehension, right? You're gonna have a context for understanding the things that happened to you a little better. And you're not gonna act out. You know, you're, you're, you're not going to be so, so bitter. And you're not gonna be angry. You're not gonna be so intolerant and vindictive. And this is another of the social science studies that come out that millennials who were told you're so tolerant back in 2006, on social surveys, they rate as the most intolerant generation relative to their elders. They also have a vindictive sense of, of social contact. Mm -hmm. They have high levels of social mistrust, as, as it's called. The vindictiveness is that when they see something done, someone does something wrong, they really want that person to be punished. You know, even if it's a microaggression. We want this culprit to pay. That's, that's the, the outlook that they have. And that's why, you know, in this cancel culture we see today, that they have high rates of approval relative to older, older generations. So that's where we get into the dangerous adult side of things. So I'll stop there and, and David, let you, let, you, let you jump in with questions. Okay, thanks, Mark. I do want to take a minute. I was kind of remiss. Uh, Mary Poplin is also on the panel today. Mary is our the founder of the Upper Room Gathering, um, so she's gonna has a few questions, and uh, she's known Mark for a while. And then Janelle Donnell is also on our board of directors, and she has a few questions, not only from her own point of view, but I think you have some from uh, uh, one of your Bible study groups. Is that right, Janelle? Oh yeah, that's news to me. <laughs> well. well uh, uh, <laughs> Anyway, I know you have a few questions. So anyway, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, let me let me kick off with something here because I, I happened to notice this before. It was just recently the uh, um, Good Morning America. There was a study that was was uh, published by the Mayo Clinic in May 20 of 21. And they said too much screen time can be linked to obesity when it replaces physical activity or encourages mindless eating while on screens, irregular sleep if they, children, are on screens more than recommended, and even violence if exposed to violent content on TV. And I think, Mark, in your first, first book, I think you drew that out, you know, this, that screen time was there. And I didn't see as much screen time addressed in the second book. Was that just because you had addressed it before and you were just looking at the consequences, such as the study from the Mayo Clinic? Yeah, I, I was looking at the, the consequences and, you know, we, we hear a lot of talk about millennial unhappiness. We hear uh, things about how they're very political. They're very political. And people who are very political tend to be highly reactive and sectarian, right? Right. You're the good guys, you're the bad guys. You know, us, it's an us versus them mentality. And we saw that when Donald Trump won in November 2016, they went ape, you know, they, they went two to one for, for Hillary. They went two to one for Biden as well. And when they lost, they just couldn't believe it. It was trauma. You want to say to them, this is politics. 
things go, politics goes up and down. Sometimes you lose. They've been conditioned to believe, well, we should never lose. We're, we're the good ones. And in their rooms at night, they never did lose. You know, if, if, if something is going wrong, you just, you just cancel it out. You know, on Facebook, someone says something you don't like, just unfriend that person. So they could manufacture this little utopia of affirmation. And what I was looking at was how that formation during those crucial years of developing your civic social sense, you know, say from 14 to 20, when you, you leave the home, you're becoming aware of the bigger world here, you encounter different people uh, that should build the habits of a citizen in an open society, a pluralistic society. They didn't get that good formation. And so I was looking at now at age 30, things like they're not getting married and having kids at nearly the rate older generations did. I, I quote one study in the book by the Urban Institute estimating that by age 40, one third of millennial males will never have been married. One third, that's, that's a high number. Yeah. And they probably never will get married. That's actually a problem with population growth, you know, population, you know, main sustenance here. You want to tell the millennials, you know, when you when you retire, you know, I'll be gone. You're not going to have enough people to collect Social Security. You're not you're not reproducing. Right. So uh, I, I was trying to look and see. In all the talk about how millennials, they become socialists, they're angry, they're joining Antifa and Black Lives Matter and they're marching and they're political all the time and they're intolerant and they're canceling. I was saying, look, instead of looking at their politics today, let's go look and see what was going on with them when they were 15. Right. That there was a bad formation. That what we see now was prepared for back in the heady days of web 2.0 right. as it's called that, that that that's the real that's the big point here and it's a warning look you've got to pay attention to what teenagers do at, at age 15 this is going to affect them well down the road right and this kind of screen addled life is a formula for later unhappiness. Oh, well, thank you. Janelle, did you wanna have, uh, uh, do you have a question for Mark? Well, um, I think that my question right now would be, where would you find the highest concentration of these type of people today? You know, when we look at the numbers, we see, it's everywhere. These digital tools came in to our country like a tidal wave. They, they took over and it happened so fast. Uh, I mean, Facebook started really 2005, 06, when it really start, got out there. And how the, the growth was exponential and teenagers led the way. Now, there's one interesting point to talk about here with the, the concentrations. Who's doing this stuff the most? Remember in the 90s when we heard about the digital divide, as it was called? This was the idea that the web is a wonderful learning tool. It has all this knowledge of the universe, science, art, all, you know, speeches, all these texts that were put online. And this is going to create a digital divide between well-off and poor working class kids. And it's gonna aggravate the achievement gap. The rich kids will have access and they'll be able to get all this material and learn things faster, better than the poor kids will. 
So actually in things like the Telecommunications Act, they put taxes in there to try to overcome this digital divide to get more kids, poor kids connected, online, wired up. Okay. We all paid that tax every, every month on our phone bill. That tax was in there. Well, we have a digital divide today. And I talk about this in the book. Uh, you know, the New York Times did a couple of very good stories by a reporter, Nellie Bowles, on Silicon Valley and how the titans of Silicon Valley, the guys who designed these tools, they don't let their kids use them. Rich people tend to control screen time much more than poor people do. Poor parents, a lot of who are single parents. And so they love the tools because it's a babysitter, right? It's one of the problems of single parentage. Uh, when you look at reading scores, there's a very good correlation between income and score, you know, low income, score low. Low income families have seen screen time explode in the last 10 years. Poor kids spend a lot more time online than rich kids do. So the digital divide is actually turned upside down. The ones who do less access do better in school and have better, better economic results later on. It's a strong factor. And in this New York Times story, there are things like, you know, Chris Anderson is in there. He's the former editor of Wired magazine. And Wired was a huge cheerleader for the digital age back, back then. And he says, you know, these, these tools were designed like heroin. That's the, the part of the brain that they activated. When wow. a kid got online and started playing the video game or getting on, on, the, on the social media, it, it, it got that rush, that exhilaration that goes with addiction. And they actually used psychologists who were experts in attention and addiction to help them design the tools. So this is, this is I think, one of the most interesting demographic points happening here that the upper income people they're wise getting getting wise to the dangers but all these politicians educators school principals they love having all these glossy tools in their schools look at us we're cutting edge look at how much money we're putting into poor schools to get them up to speed a lot of the parents don't realize this is not good. This is uh, reading scores. One of the things I go into the book is reading scores in the last 10 years, yeah. on SAT, on the ACT, on the NAEP, they've gone down. They've gone down, not up. At the same time that cell phones have become more and more common and crept down the age ladder. We've got six-year-olds with cell phones right. now. So they're on the screen when they should be learning to read and reading books with their parents at night in bed. This, I, I, I think this is a big, it's a big component in the reading score declines. And there are a few very mainstream education people who are starting to say the same thing. Now they don't wanna say this, because there's a lot of money in tech and education. They, they get a lot of money from Google, from Microsoft. They're, they're, they're putting money into the schools and a lot of it's going to wire schools. These are not what the kids need. This is, this is not gonna raise their, their test scores. This is not gonna make them better readers and more, certainly not gonna make them more wise individuals. Wow. Well, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in on the oh. Q&A section. Hold on, Mary. Uh, yeah. I want to make sure that everyone knows we're going to get to those. But Mary, did you have a comment? Well, let's go to them. I mean, I, I didn't want to interrupt. I, don't, I can't see them on the screen, so oh, okay. you go ahead. Uh, well, did you have something to say or, not, or you want me to get well, to Well, I just, 
I guess what I want, I wanted to ask you, okay, so let's say I'm a, let's say I'm a teacher and I'm in a typical public school. What do I do about that? I mean, what, now that I know this, what, what's your recommendation? Well, what I would do is if I'm an English teacher, I would make homework assignments in the old fashioned way. For instance, I would tell the students, I want from you to bring in every day in class a transcription of these pages from Henry David Thoreau's Walden. You have to do 15 minutes of transcription, transcription by hand, preferably in cursive, every night, and bring it in class the next day in your own handwriting. Now, this is what used to be done, you know, transcriptions of the prose and verse masters. And Thoreau was one of the great stylists of the American language. So now what would that do? Well, it's a very slow exercise. That's one thing, and that, that's a good thing. Two, it would make them adopt Thoreau's language a little bit, make the rhythms of his sentences, come into their own sense of things. And it would not it, it would be a slow process. You'd want them to do this for months and months, but they would begin to internalize verbal habits that would much improve upon the verbal habits they get from texting. Okay. So that would be change the, the kind of assignments that you give that inculcate slow writing and slow reading. And that would be just one, one example. That's what, that's what I would do. Now, the problem here is that a lot of parents would complain because it seems so low tech and it seems like drudgery. And you'd, you'd get a lot of uh, peers uh, in your school, other teachers and administrators saying, you know, th this sounds like caveman, you know, kinds of teaching. We're supposed to be innovative, right? We're supposed to be cutting edge. Come on. And you've got to be able to respond. Uh, the old fashioned is cutting edge in this world. Okay. That, that nothing is more cutting edge than having them write in cursive someone else's words. <laughs> so I would also have them memorize mm -hmm. memorization. You're gonna memorize, uh, each one of you, I'm gonna have you memorize a different Emily Dickinson poem and you're gonna recite that poem to everyone in the class tomorrow. Memorization is a lost activity in the public schools and it's a terrible loss. Uh, you know, memorization was always thought of as a lower order thinking skill. You know, you're just asking students to absorb and then regurgitate. That's not critical thinking. We want more problem solving, more advanced uh, mental activity in Bloom's taxonomy, the, that pyramid of, of mental acts. Well, a couple of things that I would say about that. One, memorization is a lot more complicated than just regurgitation. The, the mind is activated in the process of memorizing something in a very deep way. Two, same thing, you're building their vocabulary. No? You're getting them to have a feel for the rhythm mm -hmm. of language as well, and you're making them get into character. They got to think like Emily Dickinson. They got to get out of themselves out of their own egos, which is a very healthy thing for an adolescent to do. Finally, they got to stand up in front of the others and speak. And when you hear the uh, depleted lexicon of American teen idiom, you just, you almost want to feel sorrow how they seem to have a working vocabulary of 200 words 
and every sentence is like, 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 like. It's painful. Yeah. When they want to express themselves, you often see them struggle because they simply don't have the words. They don't have the vocabulary to describe what they feel. So everything is cool or awesome or stuff or uh, just, just this bland uh, youth patter doesn't get them anywhere. So the recitation forces them out of that teen lingo. Mm -hmm. Another very healthy thing for them to do. So those 19th century practices, memorization and transcription. Oh yeah. And, right. and by the way, it's so old, it's new. <laughs> right. <That's true. laughs> yeah. <laughs> the uh, okay, so the online the question that we got here is uh, okay. Victor Davis Hansen, who's a senior fellow at the Hoover Institute, was interviewed over two years ago and was asked why he was so thoroughly critical of the woke participants on campus and the woke university when he was part of Stanford University, and he and he responded that Stanford does ha, does not have anything that I Hansen want. Do you care to comment on pushback uh, on the pushback you received from your peers at Emory? You know, Emory University really was a professional university. Uh, you know, the undergraduate world at Emory had become really a minor player on the campus by the 90s, in a way, when I when I got there at Emory. Before that, it was more kind of a liberal arts university, but they got a ton of money in the 80s. And they built these professional schools that are actually very strong. The medical school at Emory is very, very highly regarded. The School of Public Health, uh, highly regarded because right across the street is the Centers for Disease Control at Emory. Uh, the law school, the nursing school, uh, these are the business school, very popular. So Emory really was a professional uh, campus. And you know, I, my last 15 years at Emory, I could pretty much do what I wanted, teach what I wanted, you know, to, uh, run my classes uh, according to my, my disposition. And you know, I think probably the Emory left me, left me alone, paid me pretty well. Uh, I was a conservative by then. I was a very liberal in the 90s, but I was a conservative by then and I was pro-Trump openly in 2016. That kind of put me off the chart. You know, I was just kind of a strange character. And I, I'd smile, you know, I don't want to, I didn't want to argue with people, but I'd stand firm for what I what I believed in. And you know, I think that uh, people leave you alone if you're you know, a decent colleague, but you're not gonna bend. I mean, I know that a lot of campuses, you've got a, a strong left uh, contingent that bullies and intimidates people. But you know, they're not gonna bully and intimidate people who can't be bullied or intimidated. The left doesn't waste its time going after targets that, that won't be impressed. They actually have very good radar for uh, the ones they can push. That's why liberals are much more afraid of the left than they are of the right, because they know the left will go after them if they don't toe the line. Conservatives, you know, they don't have any power. So, and conservatives aren't as inclined toward coercion and bullying as the left is. I mean, one reason because the left has been so successful in education in the last 50 years. I mean, what an amazing triumph that they have managed to bring about for themselves. I mean, the college campus isn't the same, certainly the same place now that it was when I when I was at UCLA in 1980, back then it was fun. Well, thank you. Um, one of the things in the book that I kind of 
and I've mentioned this to a couple of my friends and colleagues around, around the neighborhood, so to speak, is the idea that everyone deserves to be happy. And I think you really do address this in the book. That yeah. was just, it was like, okay, is this entitlement? I mean, it's like, it's almost like incomprehensible. Like everyone deserves to be happy. That was a conversation that I had with a student that I reproduced in the book when Milo Yiannopoulos came to campus and speak and some students were out protesting Milo coming there. And I, I thought that Milo was a comic wit and in a way a genius a performance artist, but he was such a curious figure because uh, one, he's gay, He's half Jewish, half Catholic. Um, he, his, his boyfriends are, are, are African Americans. So he, it was hard to fit him into racist or sexist or homophobic or any, any of those labels, but they, he, he would make fun of the left and political correctness. And so they were out protesting and I said to this student of mine who I'd sort of gotten close to, she was more of a working class kid. Uh, not that she was a conservative, but I, she had kind of a sensible sense of, of herself and her peers. And I said, let me ask you, you know this Milo coming to campus? She says, oh yeah, oh yeah. Which signaled that it was a topic among the undergraduates. And I said, why are they so upset about him? I mean, why do they, why, why and I thought she was going to defend Milo or criticize Milo, but she didn't say anything about Milo. She, she sort of thought for a minute and said very slowly, because they believe everyone deserves to be happy. And then she just let it go there. She thought about that. And I, I, I thought, wow, really? <laughs> that's the example, I, that's the reaction yeah. I'm getting. Everyone deserves to be happy. And to me, I had to pour over that, you know, put it on the table and look at it, you know, turn it around, flip it over. Everyone deserves to be happy. Well, what about bad people? I mean, there are bad people in the world who are happy when they do bad things. Well, they deserve to be happy. Well, they're going to get happy by doing bad things. That's one point that I, I mean, I, I thought, yeah. how could anyone believe this? I mean, we, we live in a fallen world when human desires can go in a lot of bad directions. Right. Everyone deserves to be happy. What world could possibly exist in which everyone is happy? If you try to create that world, you're gonna kill people in order to make that happen. That's a utopian wish. Everyone deserves to be happy. Oh, you made so-and-so unhappy. You're gonna pay for that. Why isn't everyone happy? Well, because we've got some bad people out there who make people unhappy. So we just gotta get rid of the bad people and then everyone will be happy. This is where utopia leads. And few characters are more unforgiving than a disappointed utopian, right? One who believes in the purity of his motives, like Robespierre. Mm -hmm. Robespierre, his nickname was the incorruptible, l'incorruptible, the pure one. And you know, he was pure. He wasn't out for his own money, his own career, his own good. He wasn't out, you know, drinking and, and, and getting, getting women and using his power in that personal way. But look what he did, you know. Off to La Veuve, the widow, the guillotine. You know, they killed a lot of priests and nuns in that country in the French Revolution. So this, I, I, you know, I, you, you have to hear something like, they really believe everyone deserves to be happy. You've got to hear the 
the positive side, you know, everyone deserves to be happy, but you also have to hear the flip side, okay? If everyone isn't happy, we're gonna do something about it. That's where the, the ruthlessness comes from in, in the woke. It's a punitive movement. If you're interfering with someone's unhappiness, you're gonna pay. So, but this is what a lot of them, a lot of the millennials believe. Everyone deserves to be happy. Of course, there never will be a world where everyone deserves, where everyone is happy. And a lot of them won't accept, look, you all want to go to the good schools. You're not all going to go to the good schools. You all want to get into medical school. You know, about 21, 22% of college students who enter want to go into medical school or some of the medical sciences. About three or 4% of them end up doing that. Very difficult. They go into organic chemistry and they get a D and it's over. It's over. You're not going to get into medical school if you get a D in organic chemistry. Right. They're not going to be happy, David. They're unhappy. Someone's got to pay for that. They felt betrayed. They're going to be bitter. You promised me that I would come to your school and prosper. You promised. Look at your promotional guides. Look at all those pictures. Everyone's happy. Everyone's smiling. And I'm not. What have you done to me? You cheated me. That's why they're marching on the president's office. In a way, they have a point. You know what it reminds me of, Mark, is years ago when Starbucks was first developing, I always noticed the signs that they had in their stores. And it was always something like that. It was, it was never anything that kind of made sense. It was something like, everyone deserves to be happy. I mean, I'm sure if I went into a Starbucks right now, I could show you some signs like that. Um, and it was a kind of, it was a, it was a bad sign of, of kind of the intellectual way we were, you know, we were approaching things. Like kindergarten. Yeah, it was, it was no, a lot like the book, you know, Google's like, good, do nice to people. Google slogan, right? Don't be evil or don't do evil. Don't be evil. Yeah. How old do you be think nice. we are? <laughs> How old do you think we are? I mean, it, it makes you become a curmudgeon, right? Someone goes, <laughs> hey, hey, how's it going? What, what, what are you doing? How's it going? And so I usually answer. And they say, what, 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 what's wrong? Everything. Well, 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 what are you going to do? Nothing. They don't quite know what to do with that. You know, it's hard for, hard for them to figure what, 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 because you haven't just given that, you know, brainless, mindless happiness mm -hmm. that's out there. So you, yeah, you get, you, you get tired of that, that, that false cheeriness because it is false. Yeah. You know, life is, life is different. Life is hard. Life is filled with, that's the tragic sense of things. You know, it's a fallen world. You know, well, be honest about it. Janelle, did you, were you, you look like you might be. Um, I, I'm wondering, um, how do you feel about all that's happening um, across the nation with um, seemingly conservative people that are um, aggressively trying to get on school boards? How does that play into all of this? You know, I'm, I live now in Northern Virginia, which was ground zero for the school board issue coming up. And you know, that was, that, the, the interesting thing was that those parents, you've got to see these not as individuals, but as parents. Because in a politically correct world, most people just make the calculation and go along with it. They keep their heads down. But when you add a child to their calculation, they're willing to sacrifice themselves a little bit in order to protect their children. So they went to these school board meetings, not out of politics. I mean, a lot of these parents speaking at the school board meetings, they were liberals. But they thought, why are you telling my seven-year-old 
that she needs to be so conscious of her skin color that you know reading writing and arithmetic i mean look at look at look at look at reading scores and you're worried about this you let me take care of of social wisdom it's not your job well when they protested this when they tried to talk to the school boards the remarkable thing in this was the way in which the school board members responded to these parents with contempt, ridicule, and shut up, you're little people. That, I think, was more powerful than just what the parents themselves said. And when Governor McAuliffe here in Virginia said in the debate, pretty much, uh, I don't think parents should have a say in what kids learn, you know? What was that telling him? When your kids are in school, they belong to us, not you. Exactly. We're, we're in charge. And boy, that, that reverberated. And I think it's reverberating in many places across the country. And part of it isn't, it, it, it is uh, not just the critical race theory garbage right. being peddled, but it's also now we know how these officials really regard us. They think we're dirt and we just have to obey. And I'll tell you, a lot of these members of school boards are wackos. <laughs> these are not serious, thoughtful, competent people. A lot of them are nuts. And so we do get things like the San Francisco election. Jonelle, is that, is that one thing that you were referring to? You know about that? A, a little bit, yes. Three school board members in, San, in super, super liberal leftist San Francisco were recalled. And San Francisco's uh, political makeup is 7% Republican. Okay. I've got two granddaughters there. Pardon? I've got two granddaughters in San Francisco. So you're, you're yeah, it'd be interesting to hear what they say, uh, what they tell you about the, the climate there. But three school board members were recalled in the election and these votes weren't even close. It was like 70 to 30% getting rid of these people. Uh, that's the mood of a whole lot of Americans now. And it's a mood not against Democrat or Republican. It's a mood against the elite yes. who do things like lay out rules, again, for us, and they don't follow their own rules. Right. You know, all the kids in California have, have, have masks on. And did you see the pictures from the Super Bowl the other day? Right. Yes. Celebrities, the athletes, the politicians, they're having fun, they're smiling, and we can see their smiles because they aren't wearing any masks. That really grates on an American's sensibility. We don't like that. One set of rules for us and another for you guys, you bums, vote them all out. Sure. So I think that the aggression is, is, is out there and a lot of people are angry over this. And from where I sit, the anger is well deserved. And a whole lot of these people ought to be removed immediately. I would love to go to a meeting and talk. I mean, my, I'm homeschooling my son now, but uh, I'd love to go with the microphone and talk to some of these uh, school board members and uh, tell them I know a lot more about this than you do you ought to be removed what you're doing here and the way you're treating all these people in this room, so. You know, Mark, um, uh, kind of along that line, um, I had the opportunity to teach at a, at a school in San Francisco and they had summer reading programs. And one of the things that I ended up doing was because I taught math and science, I had one period that in order to make a full-time load, they had me teach literature. 
And one of the summer reading programs was, uh, this is kind of anecdotal, was Grapes of Wrath was on the book, yeah. on the list. And one of these young students, 13, 14, 15 years old, you know, I asked her, what did you think about the beginning of the book? She said, it's the whole book. It's about this migration of these people who are going to have their homes uh, and they're going to carry them across the way and they're going to plot along the road. So the, uh, the opening of the book is about this turtle, right? That, that Jode, I think, Tom, you, you mentioned these books in, in, your, uh, in your book. And the question I have is, that book could easily be banned. I mean, it's really a difficult book. There's a murder. There's a lot of things that are going on there. What yeah. is this with the, the banning of these books? And what are people afraid of that, that they might be activated by these things to, to, to see that they could help people? You know, do, do you have any thinking on that? Well, it's, it's sort of something we're all seeing now. The, the banning, the, the censoring, the judgment of words uh, in so delicate a fashion. Who would have thought that pronouns would be such a tense issue? Right. Um, I think that this is, this is something that's gonna take social scientists and historians a long time to work through to understand how this country has slipped into these identity politics, these, this political correctness, this woke bar of judgment, the censoriousness, right? The humorlessness that, that we see out there today. How, what, what happened? How did this happen? That's I certainly think that the internet and social media produced a, an acceleration of outrage, right? I mean, you get clicks by being outrageous. You make money, you get attention by throwing accusations right and left. It's, it's produced a public arena, a bunch of people shouting and whoever shouts the loudest gets the most attention. So I think that that's one factor. I think another factor is uh, what we've seen happen is the elite in this country have done fantastically in the last 40 years. Right. The middle class and the working class have been barely holding on. Globalization has hollowed out small towns. You know, I'd, I'd drive through George, rural Georgia when I lived in Atlanta, go through these towns and boy, Main Street is just dead. Shops are closed up. And then I, then I reach the highway and there's a gigantic Walmart out there. You know, just, just Walmart is a globalization company. And none of the small stores could compete with Walmart. So they're, they're, that's, that's something. Uh, I think the culture sphere has been fed with bad feelings by identity politicians, by the left, right? The uh, allegations of racism and sexism and the various phobias, and that we lost the leavening of the church. The churches, the churches, were sort of holding the American atmosphere uh, in, in check in, in, in terms of tensions getting, getting out of control. And the churches don't have that influence. You know, we used to be a part of Christendom. We're not part of Christendom anymore. America is a secular state aggressively so the naked public square is is where we are and you know there are signs where some of us are climbing out of that but uh it's had to get very bad before a lot of people have awakened like the parents at the school board meetings i mean i want to say to the parents at the school board meetings look 
you think it's awful what your kids are being taught. You do know that this became mainstream thinking in the humanities by 1990. This stuff just seems so old. The, the whole critical race theory and, and the identity politics, it is so old for those of us who've been in the university system in the humanities. This has been around for decades. You know, and our Republican leaders didn't even notice or didn't want to notice. So, uh, you know, they say the left has overplayed its hand. Yeah, but I worry that, you know, the, the pendulum is not gonna swing back very far. That's always, that's always the, the problem. We get a correction, but the, the, uh, the window has still moved left you know, more toward secular, sexual revolution, uh, irreverence. I think in your book, you mentioned um, one of the things or the thing that might be done is to act, really encourage students and, and young people to start reading books. I mean, just, you know, is it, what else can we do? Is it more librarians? Uh, is it? Well, I, I think, David, it has to be on a personal level. You, you, the, the institutions are, are, are not capable of being changed. To, 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 to those of you listening, you say, I've got, I've got a job, I have a duty to speak with the younger people in my life and let them know if you're unhappy, if you're discontented, it's because that you are <clears throat> exposing yourself to the wrong things. There is so much better music out there than the music you listen to. There are better movies to watch than the movies you, the Marvel idiotic things that you watch. Go watch Francois Truffaut's film, The 400 Blows his first big film, 1959, about a young man in Paris who gets in trouble a lot. You know, he's a wayward kid from, from a sort of a dysfunctional family. Very powerful film. Watch that. Read some poetry. Read every night, read two of the Psalms. Read the Psalms. Beautiful literature. Read the Sermon on the Mount. Read Hector fighting Achilles or Odysseus, you know, trying to get back to Penelope. There's so much more in life that can enrich you and you're gonna be a happier person. You really will, you'll be a person of greater understanding. You'll be more grounded. You'll be more solid. You'll have more self-confidence. We gotta get for you a reading plan. That's why I end the book with Malcolm X. Malcolm X in prison underwent a reading transformation that proved one of the great conversion stories in all of American history. Uh, I don't share his religion. I don't share a lot of his ideas, but the reading plan he embarked upon is a model. That's why I put it in there. Yeah. He Excellent. could go into prison, a thug, a rotten human being who is violent, profane, Who's, who, whose nickname in prison the first few months he was in there was Satan, and he liked it. He liked it that they thought of him as Satan. He comes out, Malcolm X, coat and tie, well-spoken. He says, I will never use bad language again. Deliberative, thoughtful. He's read, 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 read history, philosophy, religion, and he debates people on the TV shows and he listens to them. 
He's got, you know, three white men in their 50s asking him tough questions. He doesn't say, you're racist. I'm leaving. I'm offended. He listens to them. He thinks about what's going on in their heads. He tries to figure what they're about. That's what reading will do for you. You will not be such a reactive temperament. You'll spend more time trying to understand the world than to try to force the world back into that little model of your 15 year old bedroom when everything was good and fun and you didn't have to cope with any contrary ideas, any disagreeable opinions. No, you could fabricate the me, the daily me, as it was called, your own little universe. No, that's, that's a formula for misery. It's not going to work. But you got to get there by reading other things for a long time. That's, that's, the, only, that's the only solution that I, I offer to people. That personal level, the young people you know, your kids, your grandchildren, you know, any, anyone, any young person who comes into your orbit, give them a little of that, I mentioned that St. Paul, right? Whatever is lovely, whatever is true, whatever is good, whatever just, okay, let's elevate. Elevate your exposures here. I know, Mary, you used to uh, recommend Mortimer Adler's book, uh, How to Read a Book. He's got a wonderful list of texts, uh, yeah. Harvard, the Harvard Classics, I know, Mark, you and I have talked about Norton's anthology. So there's a lot of ways that parents and people who, who are out there could start to engage with some of these really excellent texts. And then Mortimer Animal actually kind of is really good about explaining how to read, you know, how to read it for content, you know, and how to read with your kids. So I think it'd be an interesting thing. There's a question that just came in. It says, what is the proper flip side of everyone deserves to be happy? I think you address that a little bit in the book. Well, the flip side would be everyone deserves the pursuit of happiness, right? I mean, everyone should be able to pursue his happiness. Uh, that doesn't mean we want them to. We've got to give people the freedom to pursue their happiness. Again, as long as they're not you know, there, there are limits, of course, the damage that the pursuit of happiness can do. But you've got to give people that basic capacity. Um, but you accept that pursuit could go in bad directions. And so we have to, we have to curb those impulses by the lessons of the Bible. Mm -hmm. People need institutions that will guide them toward the good and the true and the beautiful. So we give them freedom, but we also give them the, the wisdom of Jesus's parables. The wisdom of the Proverbs, the book of Proverbs. We teach them about great moments of sacrifice, of martyrdom, genuine martyrdom, deserved martyrdom. We give them the eloquence that they need, examples of eloquence, I mean, that will show them. Uh, forms of expression that will ennoble them. So that, that I think is the corrective to everyone deserves to be happy. No. Thanks. Hey, Mark, Mark, it's about five after. Do you have another 10 minutes? I, we might have another couple of questions here that Sure, sure. Happy to close, but if you've got the time, I'd, I'd love it if you could say. I'm here. I'm here. Janelle, did you have anything else to, uh, or Mary, did you have any questions? There's one online that I want to give Mark to. So, 
Yeah, let's go with the one online for sure. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting, it kind of capstones this. This is why is this generation so oblivious to the very adverse serious consequences that will be paid on the down the road and the fall mainly on the, their shoulders and their futures? Well, remember, they grew up without many consequences, right? Or told that there shouldn't be consequences to, to the things you do, right? I mean, if, if, they, if they want, they can go create this other identity online. Right. And in that online identity that is anonymous or pseudonymous, pseudonymous, there are no consequences. Right. If I send that nasty email, I mean, I, 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 I've gotten emails before uh, that uh, after doing that book, and it was assigned in high schools a lot, the first book. I mean, I got emails with people threatening to come after my family. Now, I didn't take those seriously, okay? But I mean, these were really violent, nasty, vile language. No consequences. Nothing happens to them for doing that. It was, I remember one, one group, you know, we actually had an exchange that you'll never find out who we are. Well, you know, okay, whatever. But um, the, uh, the, the online world is a place where they could go out there. They could play the video games. What are the consequences? Well, I lose in the game. Nothing happens to me. So I think that that uh, they were were largely shielded from the long term thinking, right? I mean, I, I said that Silicon Valley designed the tools to make them into addicts. Addicts don't think about consequences they just want the rush you know instant gratification stimulation now what it's doing to me in the long term not even on my radar i think that the growing up also in such a heavily consumer society also pushes the same instant gratification kind of thing you know, the, the idea about saving, long-term planning. If you ask these 18-year-olds, these what's your five-year plan? The elite ones, the top 15%, oh, they got it all planned out. College, grad school, you know, MD, law degree, top firm. You know, they're, they're super planners. You get outside that elite and there is no plan. They don't think ahead. That's why they don't, they don't have kids. They don't have families. They, they're not thinking ahead. I mean, no, there, are, there are a whole lot of millennial women, 33 years old. And part of the sourness, no husband, no kids. The biological clock is ticking very loudly. And they don't know what they're going to do because a whole lot of millennial men are not interested in getting married. What are they going to do? You know, I mean, the, the, that problem is worse, worsened by the fact that, you know, women get more degrees, many more college degrees and more graduate degrees than men do. And women tend not to marry down the educational ladder. That's just the historical trend. So if you, if you go to a Cal State school and you're female, the females outnumber the males about two to one. That kind of, yeah, it's about 65% to 35%. That, uh, that changes the dating, the relationship world quite a bit. It screws it up actually. So the consequence factor, it just, it just doesn't hit them until again, this, this now in their thirties, they don't think about that. I remember I had one student 
I, I mean, we were reading something, some family thing. And, and I said, now, you know, when, when, when ladies, when you have kids, you, and once you say, I'm not having kids. And I want to say, you're 22 years old. Why are you saying this right now? How can you be so sure about something? No, I, I want a job. I want a career. Well, okay, but, but think, you know, you're going to be happy when you're 40. You know, but no. Nope. Don't think that 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 that's, that doesn't that doesn't occur to them. So the, the consequences thinking, long term, career planning some of them do, but personal not so much. Well, thank you, and thank you for taking a little extra time, Janelle or Mary. Did you have anything to uh, to wrap this up and then? Who are the ones that have escaped? I mean, there are a few. <laughs> in that age group that that really have escaped right this uh they they are that they are that top group motivated ambitious and they they form good old-fashioned bourgeois relationships marriage and kids they're, they're the, but the problem mary is it's a small group and they're not, I mean, Charles Murray talks about this, how uh, upper class liberals, they tend to live pretty traditional lives, but they're not gonna tell anyone else to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna uphold the nuclear family uh, as a model for everyone. No, we're not gonna tell anyone what to do. No, this is what we do. But we don't judge, you know, we withhold any, any, uh, you, you, you do your own thing. Well, they don't live that way because they're smart. They know better that it's bad to live that way. Marriage is a, generally a healthy step in people's lives. Makes you grow up a little, learn, learn to relate to people, learn to accept certain things. Kids, kids are a humiliation of the narcissistic ego. That's a healthy thing to happen. Uh, so, but it, it's just, there just aren't enough. Right. They don't, their model is not passed along to everyone else. And there are some of those people at every level of the income, you know, uh, yeah spectrum too i mean who just really know a lot of immigrants know i notice immigrants uh often are here who coming out of social conservative mm -hmm. places and outlooks right and i'll tell you the rest of the world is looking at the united states and saying you you guys are imploding yeah this country is is coming is falling apart it is in civilizational decline that's what other people see when they look at this country. I think the interesting thing that you point out, too, is that when you look at the history, you look at the history of the Roman Empire and you look at how how the Roman, the, the value of being a Roman citizen started to deteriorate and how the Roman Empire started to deteriorate with that. We're seeing that as well. The, the American citizen or citizenry is no longer identified with. I think you mentioned this before. So anyway, I thought that was something that came across in your book very well. So thank you again for yeah. mentioning that. I, you know, it's my belief as well as yours, I think that Christian scripture and Christian virtues, sufficient for instruction as a locus for our endeavors as educators. So thanks so much for your work. I think the book was excellent. The data that's in the book is great. Uh, I think it's a great, um sequel if you will so if you if you haven't read the first book they should read the first book and then see the follow-up with it mark you did a great job so thank you for bringing that to us I, I hope it's successful well and if you're if you're uh if if anyone in the audience wants to contact me ask me questions uh, if you have kids you want suggestions i'm happy to reply right. thank excellent you. we'll put your information on there thank you thanks mark it's good to see you all right. Thank you. We'll be in Good. touch. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Let's go ahead and wrap up. I'll close with prayer. 
and then uh, we'll uh, bid adieu. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We ask you to continue to watch over us and over the church. Help us to worship you and to live with you in peace and harmony. Guide us in the way we should walk. Give us the spirit of compassion and love for others, that we might bring the gospel to the sick, those who are in prison, and grant us the peace to those, grant peace to those who are in the ending end of their days. Bring us your peace that passes all understanding, and let us be with you in paradise forever and ever. Amen. So thank you again for everybody who's here. Uh, upperroomgathering.com, HTTPS, upperroomgathering.com is open for the public. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel at Upper Room Gathering Forum. So this will be posted and the updates will be provided to those who have uh, subscribed to that channel. So I know we're, in some ways, there are good things that are happening in technology. It's not all bad. So. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Thanks, uh, John Thank and Mary for being here. Appreciate it. Thank good night, you. everyone. Good night.